There's a young woman in my office yesterday. She's from Mexico. She's about 18 years old. She was taken across the border, kidnapped about five years ago. On the third attempt, because they were turned back twice by Border Patrol, on the third attempt, they made it through, and she was brought to New York City where she was raped approximately 30 times a day for five years. I don't know why nobody talks about that kind of stuff. How much funding has the administration transferred from other agencies to address the opioid public health emergency? If you're referring to the opioid emergency that was declared 18 months or so ago, mm -hmm. um, very little money was actually um, transferred over. Um, I'm not sure of the exact amount, but it, it was not very much money. Taking away millions of dollars from other agencies to address a wall, which doesn't even solve these issues when we're seeing that it's focused on ports of entry. Entry, But second, when we actually... May I address that, actually? In terms of if you just go by weight, and I mean, I can break it down by drug if you would like, but when you... And the numbers that I have from Customs and Border Protection for 2018 reflects the total weight of drugs at ports of entry in 2018 was 432,000 pounds of various drugs. Between ports of entry for the same time frame, fiscal year 2018, 476,000 So actually pounds. more even. In terms of total weight, I can break it down by drug if you want. So here's my big question I want to ask for the other side. Because just a few weeks ago that enough fentanyl was captured to kill 57 million Americans. You familiar with this story when this happened? Yeah, just a few weeks back, right? Yes, sir. 50, so if that's not an emergency, somebody tell me what is. Enough fentanyl to kill 58 million? 59 million? I mean, how bad does it have to get before we actually say this is this is an emergency? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here and helping us answer the fundamental question of whether we care about our sovereignty and the rule of law in our country. And unfortunately, I have the now cynical view that I'm not so sure we all agree on that. There's a young woman in my office yesterday. She's from Mexico. She's about 18 years old. She was taken across the border, kidnapped about five years ago. On the third attempt, because they were turned back twice by Border Patrol, on the third attempt, they made it through, and she was brought to New York City where she was raped approximately 30 times a day for five years. I don't know why nobody talks about that kind of stuff. When I was at the border in McAllen, in one day, in one location, 16 kids came across with adults that, didn't, that were not their parents. Further questioning and follow through led to a stash house with 54 people kidnapped inside in Houston. Nobody talks about that humanity. Those are direct results of the fact that our asylum laws are taken advantage of. That's a direct result of the fact that that woman in my office was allowed to walk straight across the border. Nobody stopped her. There's no wall, nothing. Would have been turned back otherwise and not been in New York City to suffer the absolute nightmare that she did. Do walls work? Madam Secretary, would you agree that there's three parts to security, personnel, technology, and barriers? Absolutely. Can you just take one of those away? No, sir. When I was down in McAllen and Brownsville, what we see is Brownsville is about 35 miles worth of, of barriers. And as a result, only 6% of the crossings in that sector take place because walls work. Would you agree with that? Walls work, yes, sir, as evidence. McAllen, about 1,000 people were crossing on some days because they don't have the infrastructure. Would you agree that the biggest difference between the McAllen corridor and the Brownsville corridor would be the physical barriers? Uh, the wall system, yes, sir. Been a lot of red herrings that have been thrown out there to argue these points. Drugs like fentanyl come through points of entry. Yes, we know. You would agree with that, right? Yes. Does that have anything to do with the conversation about whether we need barriers between points of entry? It does not because it's not an either or. There's a there's always the conversation about we just need more technology because then the border agents can just chase people around. We see as because we can sense them coming through. Is that the only solution, or do you need that plus barriers plus personnel? Uh, we need all three. We also need the ability to detain and remove when there's no legal right to stay. There's a point often made that the border crossings are the lowest in years. We had about 400,000 last year, although that's quickly on the rise, of, of, as you've noted, 76,000 just this last month. Is that accurate? Is 400,000 a year a low number? Uh, sir, it's not, but again, if I could, uh, respectfully, uh, it, it's because of the flow. It's because these are families. It's because these are children. That is why it's a crisis. It's a terrible, horrific journey that they undertake. You mentioned the children and why that's 
the, the nexus of this crisis. Why does that happen? Is it, is it because of our asylum laws? Is it because of the fact that if you bring a child across the border, well, and I think as you mentioned this before, if you bring a child with you, it's your ticket into the United States. All you have to do is claim asylum. Would you agree that our asylum process is completely taken advantage of? Yes, sir. Would you agree that if we were to put more resources at points of entry so that we could humanely bring people in and hear their asylum case but not let them loose into the country, would that dramatically reduce these illegal crossings as well? Would that be part of the solution as well to, to reform the actual asylum process? Yes.